and they were talking about pain and the three stages of pain are survival healing and growing and you can't skip any of those stages that's what they said there's a lot in our culture that that wants to skip ahead to the growing and i think we've kind of lost the kind of observance of healing whereas healing is like confined to this kind of alternative alternative therapy area there's really no shame or stigma in trauma <laughs> you know because your body simply cannot and will not heal itself from trauma if you're not safe yeah such a powerful powerful thing you can do with your life mm. just to go and experience and sample different cultures for me it was the single most important thing i've ever done like i got a one-way ticket to singapore age oh, wow. 23 i kind of came back and i was like my mind had opened so much i'd seen so many different things and almost connected to people that are very different to me but are at the human level like they want the same things everyone everyone's kind of after the the, the pursuit of you know happiness i guess um and that for me like blew my mind i came back and i was like in t- trying to in- it took me about a year to kind of almost integrate that just because i'd seen so much and i'd felt so much and it kind of opened my heart up a lot more to kind of have more compassion for people, have more care, have more like have more questions just day to day rather than like thinking I know the answers, you know? Yeah, curiosity. Is that the same for you, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. It's a really great point. Um, I I just, um, just resonate with the opening of the heart, you know, like I think when we get dropped in these, these scenarios where actually you can't speak the local local language. So there are many occasions where you have to rely on someone who can speak English and translate, even if it's very basic. And then you have these like cornerstone sort of safety kind of things where you, you, you're trying to find just, you're just trying to find a hotel with a bed mm-hmm. and then you want to find some food and then you want to, then, then, then after that, the curiosity is there, right? So I think the baseline, the baseline sort of needs and safety quota is, is a lot lower. And then it's, and then it's all curiosity after that. It's like, what can I see? What can I learn? What can I witness? What can I? Yeah. Yeah. And and that's, I think it's a really interesting thing because when I first came back, every time I've come back to the UK, I've had a a pretty serious bout of depression. I would say, I would say that would be me like just going really inward and trying to understand and integrate the lessons that I, I learned out there, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think integration has been a really, really, um, all in sort of all encompassing lesson for me in the last six months. Um, because yeah, embodiment of, of learning makes it sort of brings it into the habit cycle. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that depression kind of feel and look like when you, when you came back, was it, cause it's kind of tricky. You, you, you're living your best life when you travel and you almost, you know, you, you don't wear shoes that often. You're more (laughs) connected. And I've always tried to like understand whether, cause you've got your parents and and your elders telling you, Oh, you're just, boozing and and living life of carefree and i'm like yeah there is that but i'm sure there's much why not why not and why not and why not and And i'm like but there's a part of me that just doesn't want to agree to that because Mm. i've experienced it and actually i've connected a lot more to to what's natural which Mm. is day to day thinking right what what am i going to eat what am i going to appreciate when i eat that like mm. connecting more to food instead of just convenience eating and like going to in your routine you're thinking a lot more about what you're eating you're thinking mm. a lot more about where you want to stay 
and like all well, it's all these mindful approaches like why what how am i gonna intend on going about this travel mm-hmm. so it says that but there's also that you're out in the outdoors for a long long time like mm-hmm. you're rarely indoors and in these asian countries as well you, they don't spend time indoors they're outside they're lounging and and they're they're never really cooped up in an office um they're selling things on the street essentially they really have offices too much not in these kind of outskirts cities sure. but yeah so there's that yeah. so you're spending a lot more time outdoors and you're exercising you're walking you're exploring so there's all this these components to it and it, that's what mm. brings about more happiness than coming back and thinking oh i was just carefree and i wasn't thinking and i was just mm. bit on holiday for a year yeah yeah, I mean, I I want to just mention, I certainly know a lot of Asian people who do work in an office, like in a yeah, home sure. or, or something. That's also interesting. I've known so many people, like I met them in London at like UCL and um, okay. like the big universities. Um, and then I also met them again in Hong Kong multiple times, you know, and it's just really yeah. interesting to, even they like appreciate like going out hiking or, you know, mm. spending out time outside, you know, in the evening drink, like having a drink with their friends. I think it's interesting just, just the different ways that people bring themselves to, to essentially what we're saying is economy, you know, it's economic habits. Mm-hmm. I've, I've looked into a lot of things about the economy recently. Obviously we're going through a very challenging time um, in many many ways and and one of them is is economic habits and um so yeah it's that's what that's my interest it's like and it's like you mentioned the people that are from smaller villages they just they do seem to be more connected to the the rhythms of nature you know, sure and seasons as well and you're seasons. eating local fruit as well i mean i was Talking when I was traveling, I was never going into your major cities. It, it always seemed more appealing to me to be in, mm. you know, your rural, local kind of towns. Um, That's good. But yeah, so what, coming back for you, that, mm. that the depression that you felt, do you think that was a part of it? Or do you think it was, it was something more? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I'd say the whole... Th- the whole thing about being carefree is really kind of a myth. It's like, a, I think it's kind of a Western myth that mm-hmm. we can, it's possible for us to be carefree. Um, you know, you go to the beach and you just, you try your hardest to forget that you think about anything and it is possible for a, a period of time. And I think we've become very, very good at distracting ourselves, but, but let's be honest, like we have cares we have needs Mm -hmm. and i do i do resonate with what you're saying in the sense that traveling makes you more more aware and i think that's the thing when you're in a culture that doesn't speak your language that um is extremely different to you um it makes you it's almost like what i found through meditation and i i do reiki meditation and other forms of mindfulness it's you get that kind of what is reiki what is reiki for for those that don't know sure it's um it's a little it's so it was formed in japan um out of um japanese buddhism um the first uh, the guy to formulate reiki was called um mikao usui and it's a form of energy meditation so you're working with universal energy um so it's a a little bit mystic um Mm -hmm. and a little bit kind of working with the kind of qigong um aspects you know reiki actually means the same as qigong in in japanese so it just means yeah just means the life force that sort of flows through your body so you kind of work with that um in meditation um is that through with breath or with because the um, qigong is very movement centered isn't it qigong is yeah very movement centered um reiki is more stationary kind of meditation you work with 
your breath sometimes and sometimes you work with focus so one one pointed focus you know sure. you're, you're focusing on a point in your in your hands um and focusing energy into that place um okay. so it's it's very similar to qigong in that way as well like if you focus on a and an energy center of your body i'm like moving energy to that center um mm-hmm. but yeah so when i was when i was think of your reiki it's someone performing reiki on someone else yeah there's a healing the yes yeah, I, I mean it was with, with doing it yourself i suppose well it's yeah it's interesting i mean i do i do a meditation every day when i can um which is a cleanse med- meditation it's self-healing so you kind of do it you do reiki on yourself so um yeah and i'm a i'm a master practitioner actually i trained in reiki to level three so i do i do do healings in that form as well which is really powerful um it's an amazing experience um, what, so what what talking going back what, what did you why did you start looking into that and getting into it so yeah i actually met someone in cambodia so it ties in quite nicely nice. um I've always, I've always felt energy. That's, that's one point I, I want to say. I mean, from very young, I've always felt energy within my body. And, and How would you define that? Or if you can. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's energy, to... energy word gets thrown around, doesn't it? It oh, does. Negative energy, bad mm, energy, yeah. or bad I vibes. can feel your energy. <laughs> I think, I think through training through Reiki, um, there's a definite aspect to to moods and emotions like i mean people break emotion down into energy and motion right and and there's a certain and i also i also believe in frameworks you know something stories you know and, and myths i believe in them because it allows our mind to to process what we're going through right and that's sometimes where the trouble comes from is if your mind can't quite process what your body is is feeling or your body is going through so when i'm in reiki meditation there are aspects to my moods and emotions and it's kind of like what um bessel van der kolk talks about in body keeps the score you know your body keeps energy in certain forms and through the four years of training that i've done um I've started to realize what forms the energy comes in, you know, and it's very, it's really interesting. Like, for example, when I get anxious, my, my chest will feel heavy. My throat constricts a little bit. Shame is an interesting one. Shame is really heavy on my forehead. It feels like there's a weight on my forehead when I'm, and I can recognize that now. And I say, Oh, I've got shame about something. <laughs> what am I feeling shame about? Interesting. Is that is that shame you're feeling or, or someone else is well, you know, imparting shame well, on you? It's always it's always my feeling. I mean, where it comes from is another is another thing, isn't it? You know, who's imparting shame upon me? That is a really interesting because shame yeah. I mean shame can be good. I mean shame keeps us from being violent um towards people and keeps us you know, in a sort of order. Um, but it can also be toxic, you know. Can also- well, yeah, all these, all these emotions, all these emotions serve a purpose, right? I yeah. guess. And there's, yeah. and you um, can see yeah. them in a very good light, you know. You yeah. can see depression in a good light. You can see anxiety. Yeah. What is it teaching me? Yeah, the depression. Now, I mean, I just recently had about of depression last week and i think and i say bout as in like an extended period of depression but it this time it lasted like maybe two days but when i came back from traveling it lasted about i'd say about four or five months that i was sort of numbed out and sort of i felt like i couldn't do anything i couldn't i couldn't um some days i couldn't get out of bed because i i was struggling to integrate the lessons that and the way that i felt like you mentioned the way you feel when you're out there it can be very intoxicating (laughs) it can be because you have that kind of freedom 
but then that's that's also part of my privilege um as a you know like a white middle class britain um having the money to to go to another country and to feel free because my money gets me a long long way you know yes and you do feel like this is an interesting point um ties in so when i was in india last year you cannot be alone it's really hard to be alone that's good and bad but large largely it's good you walk down the street and people just want to talk to you they want to engage and they want to maybe that's to say something because that's part of the culture but in the day you, you can always have a friend mm-hmm. and you come back here and it's so easy to walk down the street and just feel like oh I go about my day without him talking to anyone. Yeah. But, but, but in a part of that, the reason I bring it up, the part of that is because you are white, you have money and people do want to engage with you. Cause there is still is that, um, you know, rightly so it's that perception. We've got the tra- we got the money to travel to these countries and. Yeah. The tourist thing opportunity is, yeah, that, that is a big aspect of, of traveling and it's like not to be scorned, I know you're not scoring it. I'm I'm just saying it's it is a, a reality. I remember being in Myanmar in the temples in Bagan and I remember I I asked a local a local guy, a local um guide that was guiding me around and he was really switched on and I was like I I noticed he was so switched on um even to like world affairs and you know Myanmar hasn't been open that long and it's it it seemed a bit incongruent to me. So I was like, um, just because of my experience of, of the people that I'd met, not, not the wider experience, but I was asking this guy loads of questions. He was like, you know, being a tour guide in this country is one of the most, the best and most lucrative jobs and the, and the biggest status jobs that you can have, you know? And even these people like who sell postcards, in in the temple sites you know they can earn more that way than you know sometimes a year from sustenance farming and you could argue you could argue it through like it's like are they more fulfilled by sustenance farming maybe is it harder work definitely you know it's Mm -hmm. it's it's a complicated argument for sure but it's it's fascinating to me and i always i always took the opportunity to learn more in that respect and um and by the way it's really interesting talking to westerners who are out i remember having a conversation we went to this temple in mingun in 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 myanmar it took us two days to get there because of the transport wow. we, had, we had to sleep over in this town where you needed to get like a tourist um Ah, uh, you needed to get a, a v, kind of a visa t- from the government to say, yeah, it's okay for you to be here. You know, there was only two hotels that we were possibly like allowed to stay in. And um, and I got to this temple, which was supposed to be the the biggest example of its kind ever built, but they got three quarters of the way th- through it, and there was an earthquake, and the the whole temple just cracked right down the middle and and so they abandoned it and you can still go there and climb on top of this thing and it's it's quite gnarly because because the, <laughs> there's just holes in it like you could just fall right down inside it but um and i just met i met this other western guy on top of the temple and we were chatting about life and that was interesting too. It's like, how did you, how did you end up here? Like, how did I end up here? Why am I, why did I take a two day trip to this place? You know, those are the questions that we ask ourselves when, when we travel that we don't necessarily ask ourselves like in normal life in normal, I say normal, but in life, in Western life. Yeah. Yeah. And they almost start the, well, for me, the, the self-discovery process, right? Yeah. Could you talk a bit mm. about that and when your journey journey kind of started? Yeah. 
with that kind of um yeah of the journey of the south i think i called it i, yeah. I started writing a little self-discovery self-development self-awareness it's really just the self and what what that really means yeah yeah absolutely um it's hard for me to pinpoint when it started i think i've been on it since i was born to be honest um okay when are we more aware of it that's a different question <laughs> yeah pedantic of me um it's when um i'd probably say what we were talking about the first the first example was when i went to china to, to teach english for the summer um yeah but i always had that sense um and i wrote an article on medium about it in in terms of like there's a voice that we often hear and i love i love the process of to discovering which voice i'm i have you know where's it coming from which which emotion or which which even which person i know that we pick up a lot of our voices from from childhood like your mother voice or your father voice and then you, as a child you internalize it usually usually with a bit of blame self blame you know and it's um those voices come from somewhere um so i always had that kind of i can be more kind of voice like this this can't be it sort of thing all throughout my life um and and all I had a lot of um, trauma in childhood. You know, that's part of my story. Quite a... Yeah, that's interesting that this can't be it. Yeah. That kind of moment where you're it's a seeker, isn't it? You're trying to look for seeker. something. Yeah. You're, look, you're looking for something more and you know it's there. You just haven't got quite the tools or, yeah. or the, the, the things in this reality to, 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 to attain them, I guess. Yeah. But you just know it. There's, you you resonate with something someone said and you just think yeah. I kind of hit a frequency there. Frequency, so yeah. I, I know there's something more to the life than what I've been experiencing lately. Uh -huh. So it's like, okay, how do I tap into that? And then you, you follow your nose a little bit, but yeah, maybe yeah. chat a bit about, a bit about that. Yeah. Where did that, where did that lead you? Well, I think I mentioned trauma because it's quite common in trauma like and they describe trauma as a frozen aspect of yourself you know like something that you mm. can't access or you can't you can't um embody um and yeah in that sense like when you meet someone that is embodying a frequency that you can't or but you recognize that in them and something in you and we talk about the self you know, I, I believe deeply in the self and and the ability of the self to talk to you through 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 all of these things you know if i think if you meet someone you think oh that hit that really hit a chord and and all of these languages by the way they're all like they're all like kind of integrated wisdom that we already have in our culture we use them correctly don't we you know it hits a chord or like you know that's a vibe or I know that I'm probably speaking into my echo chamber here, but <laughs> it's, oh no, um, that, I think that's brilliant. That integrated wisdom that we kind of we pick up language that kind of works for us, and I think yeah. language is also a it's a way to connect to other people. When you hear someone talking almost in the way you do, you think, oh, you know, yes, you, that's even, it. Even without you knowing, you're like subconsciously, oh, I can, yeah, yeah, talking a bit like me. Whether yeah. it's yeah. It, whether it's spiritual, whether it's practical, whether it's yeah. black and white, whether it's, you know, curious, whether it's more questions or yeah. just even words. Yeah, words. And words have so much power um, mm -hmm. within them. They carry an energy of their own. Um, you mentioned spiritual, and I know that that's kind of, that's kind of a word that gets sort of debated <laughs> about, you know, and, but, but spirituality to me, like, I mean, I, I see myself, as a sort of proponent of embodiment spirituality but what does that actually mean it means i have I know, a body yeah. it means i have a body it means i have a spirit and it means that my spirit moves through me whenever i talk whenever i get angry whenever i get sad or depressed or or excited or joyful that's my spirit moving through me right and that's that's what i that's how i see life 
an expression. Sure. Life is moving through you. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's beautiful, mate, because yeah. then it never, it kind of never ends in a way. (laughs) And we know it doesn't, it will move through us and through other people. And if we picture life in that way, then, then it's almost like it, it does it without a doubt makes you think there is something greater mm. out there mm. and, and yeah. something that's happening for some sort of some sort of reason life is moving through me and it's almost designed to do that I don't know. It's, it's an yeah. area that I, I think about a lot, but the more I think about the more questions I have and then the less <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, and that's beautiful. <laughs> it is because yeah. you've got a passion for something uh, and it's, and it never ends. Then, then great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm and continuously going to be, going to be passionate. I mean, I, I'm so, I'm so excited to be a lifelong student and that is the way to live life for me. And I, I realize that that is the resonation I have. Like I've done a lot of soul searching and come up with that resonation of being a seeker. Like I'm, I'm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't class myself as a, as, as a person that wanted to keep things the way they are. I'm curious and I try to be flexible and I think I'm also, you know, a creative and I, I, I play around with music and and writing and I think the story is, is really important. We have this kind of default, default mode network in our brains, you know, the, the habits that we form long-term go into that default mode. And in a way you could say that you build your own story and I'm not, I'm not saying that's easy and I'm not saying that people don't go through, through things that, that create a story for them. I've had experience of that with trauma in childhood. Like I, my story was created for me in many, in many ways, but as we grow and as we gain more um, leadership over our own life, that story aspect becomes very very important and we can actually start to choose what story we tell ourselves right yeah if we take control if we we start to ask ourselves these questions if we start to develop our own self-awareness then we can start to take the lead yeah yeah so that's that's a that's a big thing too i mean i'm Mm -hmm. i'm part of a men's group now i'm working um i identify as a man and um i'm working a lot on on the kind of it's it's an interesting thing it's it's sort of centered around archetypes and that kind of jungian psychology and also like myths the great myths of of our of humanity which have survived thousands and thousands of years um so what constitutes like a healthy masculinity as well, which I believe is an, is a question that we deeply need to ask ourselves in, in the entire human race possibly, but, but very much in the West, um, you know, um, there's a quite, a, quite a famous coach, I guess called John Wineland. And he said, most of the world's problems come from the unconsciousness of man and interesting and it's interesting and i think we've inherited this story that is thousands of years old and i'm quoting people now like this isn't my just my thoughts um (laughs) i can't remember (laughs) who said these things but um we have inherited this story and perhaps it's the time to at least you know at least be a, a lifelong student and get curious about what we're believing and what we want to take on into the future Mm. yeah sure um i was uh, talking to nina the other day my partner about this kind of rise of the feminine Mm. and how she's been suppressed for so many years and we're kind of thinking back okay well actually the woman is is almost i don't know what the word is but in, in indigenous cultures the woman is is represented as this powerful, all-knowing kind of 
person. Um, but then I'd say specifically rise of civilization two and a half thousand years ago, the, the man dominated and there was such an imbalance for so many, so many years. And it's only now is it really starting to kind of, that there's imbalances in both ways and it's trying to find its equilibrium, I guess. Yeah. But yeah. it's there's definitely in the next 10, 15 years, you're going to see a massive rise of the feminine. Yeah. And, and it's interesting are. to me. We are seeing that for sure. And I welcome that. It's so exciting yeah. to me. Honestly, it is. It's so exciting. Yeah. To me. Yeah. It is um, amazing. It is exciting. Yeah. It does. It does. But, but, but because men have been so dominant and such a mm. figure mm. throughout the world, it, it's only going to yeah. open up into questions about our own mm-hmm. place in this world. Absolutely. And I was going to, I was going to move on to that point. So it's cool that you, you, you got there um, before me. That's awesome. It's a, it's a synergy for sure. Like it's the way that the feminine has risen, has, has, you know, arisen um, questions in, in the masculine, you know? And like you said, it's like, when 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 a culture is so dominant um they don't need to ask questions of themselves and i think i think that kind of masculinity has been unconscious for sure um and now you know there's a there's a really good book that i read recently called um it's by mark mark green and it's called something like the me too masculinity and the me too movement and um it's a very short book but um he describes how the me too movement kind of drove this kind of existential crisis in masculinity um because it made us question pretty much the entire sort of power structure of our society in a way um but also the fact that men suffer greatly in the patriarchy um and that is a big question too. This kind of toxic masculinity um, creates kind of silence um, where we judge our feelings to be weak as, as men and we're told not to cry from an early age. So we internalize um, that message. And yeah, it's almost like, don't be a woman. Don't. Yeah, that is literally what we're told as kids. Like, don't be a sissy. And by the way, there's there's double meaning there. It's like, don't be a woman. So squash your femininity. Yeah, and, and also, women aren't good, right? That's what that message is is telling young young boys. And 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 also, there's a big thing around Dr. Glover's work with masculinity. He says that the you know the messaging that comes from um from your mother to your father you know what what does your mother tell you about your father uh, in that culture and and usually there's a there's a fair amount of 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 subliminal messaging there um so i guess i guess i'm bringing all this up because it there's so much to to our lives right (laughs) there's so many messages and so many voices in our lives and I think where this originally originated from this, this kind of thread of conversation was, you know, traveling and also meditation. It gives you the ability to witness your own experience. Mm -hmm. It gives you the ability to witness your own voice and where your voice comes from and, and how it affects you. Oh, when I think this, it's in my mother's voice, for example, you know, no shame or blame attached. It's my mother inside of me. I've internalized it. And then how do I feel? How do I feel when I feel that? I feel excitement. I feel joy or I feel shame or I feel anger. And then in my experience, almost all the time, that emotion wants to move somewhere. Hmm. It wants to be experienced. It wants to be witnessed. And How do you... Uh... How, how do you think that happened? Like, is in, is in, there's an emotion there. There's something you've sat with yourself, which is really good, by the way. I think that's that's one of the main reasons I, I meditate is is to yeah. open to allow space to see what comes up, 
you're not yeah. trying to do anything you're trying to see what what comes up in in yoga that's that's huge you, yeah, you're yeah. moving you're moving in a flow and and things will start popping up emotions things and it's not just your thoughts these are like manifestations in your body just like you're mm -hmm. opening a certain shoulder joint and something will just come into your brain it's like whoa what just happened there mm -hmm. so yeah so so when that happens for you mm -hmm. how do you uh, i suppose how do you internalize mm, i need to it, it needs to come out yeah that's a good question that's a great question thanks it's for me i have I have awareness of for the first moment, it's what I use to distract myself when I'm feeling something. So that's the very first awareness that I have. And, and for me, it's comfort eating. I comfort eat all the time. My brain's like, Oh, I fancy some <laughs> snacks or I fancy, like you said the other day, cheese on toast. Like I'll go back to my, to my child my childhood you know and and child food kind of i'll go there or it's like i'll i'll think oh i maybe i should take a bath to relax or i'll get into this state of distractive brain like i'll be on social media if i'm ever scrolling social media like i'll go on social media and in interact very intentionally but if i'm ever scrolling so social media i stop I'll, i can be aware that i'm in that distraction mode so that's the first step and then i i say to myself so how what am i feeling so <laughs> i mean as a man just to start with um i think that's a really good step um and and i journal i journal a lot around feelings just because i didn't have the vocabulary and i i bought this thing from this really good from the school of life in london um it's called the emotional barometer which is a really really awesome tool okay um so it's basically like a wheel um um that has has all the emotions on it and, uh, and you're then, looking for it you, you're not finding it on the floor <laughs> have you got it there <laughs> i got it down here i was just thinking whether to yeah why yeah, not let me see it there. the emotional barometer so it's a book right or is it it's actually oh, not it's, it's like, like cards, to, cards. To, to, to okay almost like yeah. um what's it called picture cards or something yeah flashcards or something yeah i mean you get a little card and it says dreamy on there and it and then it just sort of explains lucy what dreamy is and the thing is that well, well it's education isn't it around yeah right, it's technology. education it's education that's the word and it's great i mean it's like and that was lacking in my life you know so I think, hmm. I think that was the thing is, is you get curious around where, where you're lacking, where I'm lacking in my, in my process. And one of them was, you know, emotional intelligence. Um, so yeah, I went on a journey with that. And then I guess once I, once I was on that journey, I started to dive a, a little bit deeper in there and, and realized what kind of emotions usually sort of lie on top of each other i mean i i've taken i'm still taking psychotherapy um been doing it for over a year now I, around the childhood trauma so that gives yeah. me a, a great tool a great resource um sure absolutely which is yeah. for anyone who's not really familiar i'd put it as a fitness coach for your mind or, or someone yeah. that's just gonna spot you while you bench press you know it's, <laughs> yes. it's that kind of that support <laughs> someone that's gonna like yeah. be there with you whilst you work out and work in yeah, yeah. this is inner work this isn't this isn't uh, my yoga teacher at um the yoga station in whitley bay he calls it a work in not a workout that's that's brilliant which is brilliant i, I love that often the simplest is the most effective yeah yeah um terminology but yeah um let's let's unwrap a little bit and depending on how far you want to go in, into that mm, but the tra mm. the trauma because i think that's a word sure. that's going to be it is obviously coming to mm. to, to the mainstream more and more mm. i listen to Mastin kip if anyone wants to delve into a mm. real like pragmatic um definitions and understandings of trauma Mastin kip is phenomenal mm. i've only just heard about him but he's, he's been around for a while 
Um, but yeah, trauma, could we perhaps unpack that a little bit and what it kind of, I mean, in yeah. its simplest form, it's because people, it's psychological trauma and then there's emotional trauma, right? There's many, many different types of trauma. Mm-hmm. I think, I think the best, the best explanation of trauma that I've come across is, is a frozen aspect of yourself. Um, sure. Just because it, it, it speaks to me. I mean, I like metaphors in general and I like analogies in general, but, but I see that. And, and Bessel van der Kolk, his body keeps the score book. And also Dr. Peter Levine, if you're interested in, in trauma and somatic experiencing, it's, it's, it's really seminal kind of work around, around the human experience. And it's, it's like it's just frozen aspects it's like it's habits it's it's patterns it's it's things that that we're unable to unlock and unpack and and yeah. embody and and integrate into our life experience and yeah. oft, often it's they they talk about it not being the event of the trauma that's the problem it's the it's the inability to to process and integrate after after the trauma's happened okay there are there are a number of things from dr levine's work that i really have taken in in the sense that our nervous systems are are designed to kind of shake off um huge um kind of shocks to our systems if you imagine we have a very similar nervous system to to a lot of animals and you know because we evolved from apes um I mean, not excluding people who don't believe in that, but um, it's um, <laughs> for the, for the analogy's sake. Let's for the say analogy's sake, from apes. Yeah, um, in my belief, <laughs> but um, so it's so it's you know when you recognise how animals deal with trauma, you know, for example, if they're hunted, um, it's it's very interesting you know because we have the same sort of mechanisms you get the shot of adrenaline um to run away from the predator or or the you know fight flight or freeze response um but then actually the conversation sort of tends to stop there and i think there's an there's much more to the conversation and and someone who's like myself who's been through quite serious childhood trauma that i couldn't you know, I was going through those stages um, after the the place where the conversation tends to stop, you know, so it's fight, flight or freeze. But then after the fact, you have all this sort of frozen energy within you Hmm. and um, your body's natural response is to, to like shake it off or, or like hold it somewhere within your body. But um, do you think that's a natural response to to hold it within? Yeah, absolutely. And then release it later. I get. I guess just mechanism, isn't it? It's It's like right. I'm in the. I've just been caught by a tiger. I'm gonna freeze. I'm gonna go limp because I'm gonna conserve my energy essentially. Yeah, so that's a kind of last case scenario where the the animal or, or or myself is in a situation where I feel like the only option left is to freeze. And so if the tiger, for example, if the tiger like drags, drags the prey to, to it's like young ones and then kind of leaves, leaves it there for later, there's, there's a possibility for the, the prey to like run off again, you know? So if you, so it's like playing dead. So <laughs> And we, we have these things and it's very common for, for people who've experienced like a high level of, of childhood trauma to numb, numb out basically. And that's the, that's the same response because if, if you're in a, a dangerous situation or what you perceive to be a dangerous situation um, for an extended period of time, like you, the chances are that you'll, you're numbing out and just, and, and I think it's a, my personal belief is it's a mechanism for survival and we all do what we can to, to survive. 
and I, I tell this to my friends who have also experienced childhood trauma. It's whenever they have a hard moment, it's like, okay, well, what's the survival? Where's yeah. your survival? And yeah, and also you there. What, what your body did in that situation was the r- absolute correct thing for yeah, it. Exactly, exactly. And once, you, once you flip that and think, okay, I did that for, a, that was my reaction for a good reason, to protect myself yeah exactly you keep keep alive and uh, and these things they're efficient actually and just think about it that way i mean i i i'm really i am really a scientist at heart like i love science and i love efficiency and they're efficient they're super efficient and they're a way for the body to continue to work in a really stressful situation sometimes life-threatening or perceived life-threatening situation to keep the body alive and to keep you living, mm-hmm. you know? So I can be grateful for that. I can find the gratitude yeah. there. Yeah. So, so once you understand, right, this situation, this experience that I went through, mm. I've, I've, okay, I've understood what happened in that scenario. I, I reacted this way, mm. but because I didn't necessarily deal with it afterwards, Mm-hmm. I didn't. That could come from talking about it. It could come from, um, I don't know. What, what yeah. do you think? What what are the what are the ways of dealing with trauma? Yeah. Any kind of trauma, really? Yeah, I mean, and that's another point. It's like I didn't deal with it afterwards, and there can be a shame and a stigma that comes from that too. And it's like the thing that you need is safe a safe environment. You need a safe environment to explore. And you need support and you need not just any support, but support of people that know how to help you to heal. There's, um, there was a great, I'm part of a, a group by David Kessler, who does a lot of work on grief. And he was talking to Steve Leader, who's a rabbi in LA. And they were talking about pain and the three stages of pain are survival, healing and growing. Okay. And you can't skip any of those stages. That's what they said. You can't skip them. Um, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot in our culture that that wants to skip ahead to the growing, you know. And and I think we've kind of lost the kind of observance of healing in a way. Um, whereas healing is like confined to this kind of alternative alternative therapy area, um, sort of alternative culture in a way that's what that's the messaging in in there um so yeah so there's really no there's really no shame or stigma in in trauma (laughs) you know because your body simply cannot and will not heal itself from trauma if you're not safe and if you Mm -hmm. don't have uh, if you don't have enough support and and by the way, I just, I do feel there's an intuition around that as well. You know, I think that you definitely like a resonation, you know, like the frequency you were talking about earlier with when you meet someone and you think, ah, they've got something there. It's, it's embodied. And, and I know that they know how I feel or they know they've been through that journey. And and also, I'm not saying anything bad about people who don't, who can't support you. Like for for years, I was like resentful about that. I was like, they should, they they have to, they need to support me because I need them. And and that we talk about surrender sometimes, don't we, Chris? And it's mm-hmm. and that's a good point to come to. I think is, is surrendering to the fact that it might not be a certain person that that helps you to to grow and heal from your trauma um you might have to surrender to the fact that it might not be the person that you want it to be um and also there's people that perhaps you want and you almost to some point may expect to be healers of your trauma or be supporters uh in that way Mm. could be going through their own trauma and and their own trauma could be and I'm not able to, 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 to recognize emotions in that way. Yeah, because, exactly. Cause I've had to, cause, cause my trauma was, was 
yeah, exactly. a certain situation where I showed my emotions and then they got shamed and they got, they got, they got, yeah, shamed. They got <laughs> shamed in that yeah. moment for being not a good thing. It didn't serve me. So yeah. therefore uh, from a very young age, I wasn't able to, well, I thought it was best not to show my emotions. Yeah. And now I can't connect with something you're going through because it would mean me get me being emotional. Yeah. That's a good point. And, and I think that speaks to like blocks, um, like in trauma being the frozen aspects of ourselves, it comes back to that. It's like, if, Mm -hmm. if you're trying, I mean, I love, I mean, not alone in loving this, this guy, I love Albert Einstein for his, (laughs) his, his spirit and his, like he was a deeply spiritual person. Yeah. And he said like insanity is tr- is trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome and and i believe in that wholeheartedly because it's true and i feel like expectations are the things that keep us in that zone of trying and trying and trying again and we get to this this area of complete exasperation and kind of hostility and but then if you I mean, I've, I've experienced my own, um, my own journey around that. I've had a visceral example of that happening, just trying, trying to get someone to hear me. But really, if you, if I, if I'm able to step back and understand and observe and witness what I'm experiencing in those moments, it's, it's me trying to say something to someone who can't hear me because of their own frozen aspects of themselves right and it 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 might not be the case that i'm the person to heal those frozen aspects so we're we're in this kind of we're in this space where it's we're stagnant we're in a stagnant place where where we're not going to progress from there because if if we break it fully down it's like the energy isn't right in that situation yeah you're not just simply you're not accepting the reality of the situation so it's interesting isn't it and and i think if if you if i can surrender and have forgiveness for myself and compassion for myself and also them i think i think i think that forgiveness and compassion has to start with the self you know and then i obviously have got that from many of the people that i listen to but Mm -hmm. um if I can find myself in that space, then it opens me up to the possibility that actually maybe this person isn't the person to provide that, but they can still be a very important person to me. And actually that's more loving than yeah. the other. Yeah, absolutely. And accepting someone where, where they're at. Yeah. Um, when you do that, they, they just are able to be themselves a bit more. They don't. Yeah they don't feel a hostility because it yeah. just, just happens like that. And obviously yeah. this is a very complex topic. It's not as simple yeah. as this. There are many exactly. different scenarios for many different people, but at the end of the day, you place an expectation on someone else's just feeling towards you. Just, mm. I, I kind of don't know why I love the example, but it's so clear cut and everyone can relate to it. So say if someone, a, um, a girl gets cheated on in the past, and then there was their new boyfriend. And that is a trauma. Like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if you haven't, the only way you're really going to deal with that is when mm-hmm. it comes up again, when the je- je- resulting in jealousy. So when mm-hmm. then jealousy comes up again, so you're with your new partner and uh, the partner looks at another girl and you're like, oh, that's jealous. Oh, I feel jealousy. Why am I feeling jealousy right now? I'm going to be jealous of, you know, he's not, um, he's not doing anything wrong there. So, okay, Mm. that's the trauma, which was I did get cheated on in the past. So Mm. I feel like everyone can relate to that in some some way. (laughs) It's Mm. very relatable. And and the only way to really deal with it is acknowledging it, noticing it's there. But then if the other person doesn't, isn't ready to kind of acknowledge where you're at with it, the problem gets further and deeper if, if you don't accept where they are at with it. Yeah. You know what I, mean? I think, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I love, I love a resource around this. So Esther Perel talks about this a lot. 
Um, and I think what we're talking about is like ruptures in trust. Um, and they, yeah, of course, that's very complex. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it's a big rupture um, in fidelity. And I've definitely been through that in my own experience as well. Um, so, and, and the reasons behind it are very complex too. You know, um, Esther Perel says sometimes that um, men cheat to stay with a partner. If they feel disconnected from them, they're trying to reach yeah. out to them. Women, women tend to cheat for to to move away um, mm-hmm. from a from a situation that they they can't either they can't understand or can't handle anymore. So yeah, it's very it's very complex. I'm not I'm not so well versed in that, um, but it's it's no sure. Complex. I just I just think the example is quite okay. It's yeah. something like that. It's just relating to a mm. trauma. Yeah, something trauma. That, people probably wouldn't relate that as a trauma. No, but yeah. it is. It's something that at the time you weren't able to cope with. Mm. That's interesting, and, actually, because there are many things that um, traumatized people do to um, handle their trauma, um, to maintain um, the shame around the trauma, which actually is an interesting part of my reading into shame is the maintaining of, of shame breeds um, kind of the personality disorders and the sort of ways of being. Um, I mean, personality disorder as the extreme case, um, but like the ways of being and the neurosis is that we use to like relieve the tension and anxiety and stress of, of those frozen aspects. And like you said earlier, they do reoccur. And they do get stronger because the body doesn't want to hold energy. It doesn't want to. It wants to resolve it. It wants. Uh, it wants. It want it. And in, in and in any case, you're always in relationship with people, so that so the if you have these traumas around relationship, they will surface on you, right? They will, because your your partner is a mirror for your deepest aspects because that's what love is you know it's 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 a it's a it's a container where you can explore your deepest deepest aspects and so Mm, yeah the the relationship yeah and so i was gonna say i was gonna say like a, a, a few of them is like craving tendency you know addictive tendency and i read the i read a book that really changed my life around that called the craving mind. I can't remember who it was by, but, um, Oh yeah. Yeah. I've heard of it. it oh, yeah. it's, um, it's in your audio books. It um, is yeah. Audio me books. and Pete swapped audio books, uh, Amazon. I mean, sure. If you want to kind of <laughs> double up yeah. on your books, swap with someone change, <laughs> just give each other your password. <laughs> we need to yeah. exchange back. Actually. I think some people are watching my phone. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's it's from um, ooh, I want to say like P. Duncan or something like that. Can't remember. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't remember who. But yeah, he's. I mean, and also, you know, for me, for me, I um, sexual promiscuity, and I actually experienced sexual trauma in childhood. So, been exploring, you know, the ways that it creates an unhealthy dynamic in intimacy in sex in the uh, concepts of violence as well and yeah so there is a lot there there's it's not and i i think this kind of rhetoric around you know cheat like cheat is always cheat you know there's some wisdom there um because it might be deeply ingrained it might be deeply ingrained in someone's psyche to do that and but 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 i think we should be exploring this conversation in the way that we have it because to say like oh cheat is always cheat you know that that is writing off someone and and i've experienced a lot in my lifetime of sort of trying to reach out to people and be like hey i am messed up here like i need some help but but the ways but the ways in which i did it were coming across in these sort of unhealthy 
ways it's all it's all kind of like a cry for help and i i sort of i resonate with the sense that it's not someone's responsibility to to help me but the other side of that is people who have been traumatized need help so there's a balance there right i mean it has it has to be more approachable has to be less stigma around these things you know and i think infidel- infidelity is is a big area is a big um signpost is a huge signpost for trauma that's how I, that's how i feel and my friend justin talks about it as um oh what does he say he said something like emotional un unrealized emotions I mm. think and maybe he got that from somewhere, but I mean, we have these amazing hour long conversations once a week, which I would, I would recommend to anyone, you know, find someone who's interested in you and, and yeah. have a conversation with them. Absolutely. It's, it's like going out. So you're into skateboarding and yeah. just finding someone who's also on your level and going mm. out with them and learning from them and like being on the same journey with them through the skills that you're learning yeah. find. Yeah, for sure. I was going to ask you like what kind of practices you mm. recommend to people or, but that is one significant thing. Yeah. You feel like I want to talk about these things, but I don't know who to talk about them to that. You just need to start talking about them because you will find someone yeah. who, who wants to kind of navigate this with you. Yeah. And you, and, and also you're going to mess it up. You're going to fail. And that's the thing. I th- also feel the stig- there's a stigma around failure and it's, and mm. you will fail. You will fail. And it's beautiful because you know what, from the failure, there's always the learning always. Yeah. The phone's going off. <laughs> there you go. That's all good. See? Um, <laughs> yeah. No. What was I going to say? Uh, I think that's a whole nother podcast isn't it yeah maybe we, yeah the failure thing because there's so much yeah, in that maybe we maybe we'll leave that it. there yeah. it feels ingrained though doesn't it it feels like there's yeah. no way about it we just don't want failure yeah but there's there's no it, talk science talk facts and figures statistics you fail business once like all these people that failed so many times before they were successful mm. it's just it's just amazing that's the thing yeah, I mean, we can we can have another conversation yeah, about that right. one. I think because <laughs> yeah, because successful people fail all the time. You know, they fail. They failed. You know, their failures are ongoing. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. yeah. And I found I found it really important to develop a gratitude around that. Um, I think gratitude is a really important practice. Yeah, um, and it's. And that that is a key point, I think. You know, there are things that you c- cannot avoid. And it's sort of like the surrender and the acceptance conversation, really. And also maybe forgiveness, self-forgiveness and compassion. It's like there are things in life that you can't avoid. You have to experience them. If you If you avoid experiencing them, they will be repressed and then they'll come back to you later on. And actually, it's it's common for them to come back stronger and more you know more kind of traumatizing in a way so yeah it's it's an interesting conversation and whenever i i think triggered you know because you can be triggered into joy but it you know triggered if you get triggered into a trauma then um mm-hmm. it's an opportunity i have I have been re-traumatized into a space where I'm back in survival, right? And it's like, okay, like, and that's a very complex discussion. Maybe not going to go into that right now, but but there's definitely a space where you get, like, I know that self-care is my number one aim. Number one aim is to understand what I'm feeling and how to get myself out of that kind of state that triggered state but then there's also a gratitude because you know every opportunity to understand those states means that they're less likely to happen in the future 
So yeah, and that's the goal. That's the goal. You know, that's the work that I do in psychotherapy and in men's groups and in in my personal practice every day. Mm. You know, it comes from that space. It was, I think, it was on Mastin Kip's podcast. <laughs> so he's talking about <laughs> um, stopping that ancestral. Ah, oh, that's a good one. Stopping that kind of ancestral cycle. Where it's like cutting yeah. it the cord because you'll pass it on to your kids. You yeah. will. You that's... will if you, do, if you don't understand this stuff. Yeah. It, and it's your traumas. It will manifest and it will come out yeah. in them. And it's like, if you don't do it for yourself, do it for your kids. Yeah. And honestly, that is where I found my dedication, my, my commitment. That is where I found it. Honestly, that's that's awesome that you bring that up because in your unborn children, yeah, and and that even if that is just a concept and it doesn't realize itself in my life, even if I I literally talked to my therapist yesterday about the fact that I'm like 32 now, I don't have kids, like I always wanted kids, and I wonder whether this kind of experience of trauma is going to take that away from me, you know, not being able to have kids because I I can't self regulate. At the moment, I can't regulate my emotions. Um, maybe it's slightly. Um, so you've done pretty well. It's been an hour and twenty. And you've <laughs> that's what I was going to say. It's like maybe I, maybe that's the voice in my head. Maybe that's the trauma voice in my head. You see, um, but um, that is where I found my dedication in in this journey. Is like enough is enough because. My, my personal story has a lot, a lot of intergenerational trauma and, and and that concept is very young like that concept is is very young i feel you know the sense of passing on trauma to to your children um is just started to be explored in in science in in experimentation psychology but it's it's fascinating, it's yeah. fascinating. and uh, and I always had a sense of this stops with me. This, this whole thing is stops with me. Like no more, no more suffering. But I, I know the Buddha said suffering is life. So, you know, <laughs> suffering is attachment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Then, yeah. So, I mean, in the Buddhist view, like, you know, once, once you observe suffering, you know, then you, you're not, you stop embodying it. Right. Hmm. you're not completely suffering you're 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 you then become something different you 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 become a bit more of the the like suchness is what it sort of translates to and i was listening to alan watts i love alan watts just i mean just because the amount he talks he self-proclaims he talks nonsense for like an hour and then people think he's really clever (laughs) but i just love i love him he's like philosophically talks about that um yeah that's that that being more than our thoughts being more than our suffering and it comes back to what we were saying earlier right about meditation and about there's an idea in in the meditation you know and in buddhism that meditation should not just be when you sit down on your on your mat and or on your bed or whatever for 10 minutes it it becomes a way of life and yeah that resonates deeply with me because the more you practice the more that you are able to do it in that split second like oh anger you know anger like i'm feeling anger what's where is this coming from it's coming Mm -hmm. from this wound that i have or it's masking a fear that i have okay i understand that how do i want to respond i'll respond in this way and sometimes that response is anger. It's like, it's, it's a violation of my boundary. I want to set the boundary. That's very important. So let's go ahead and be angry. Um, but sometimes it's, it's choosing a different path. Yeah. And then the work I do in men's work, you know, around these, con- these um, conscious coaches, um, Connor Beaton is the guy that runs my men's group um, that I'm a part of. Um, and he talks about clean anger and it's like a lot of work has been done around that. And it's, it's, it's a thing like clean anger is comes from the body, not the head, right? You don't have to raise your voice, but, and you don't have to be aggressive, but 
but clean yeah. anger is 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 a, a marker for when your boundaries have been violated and you want to state them and boundaries are very very important very yeah. important to relationship aren't they so if boundaries yeah. are violated constantly then things will escalate because that's the nature of things and and it's down and in a way it's sort of down to us to embody our anger properly the first time to make it really really clear and to express our anger really really clearly and of course it's not always possible um but if we manage to do that the first time then clean anger uh, apparently lasts like 90 seconds maximum interesting yeah and i'd say yeah. just check check yourself as well <laughs> yeah it's so, so important to to do that after you've something's happened you've had an experience with that deep emotion mm. just check in after yeah was and it also that thing about failure that we mentioned you know uh, being human is messy it's mm-hmm. messy you're not always going to get it right. You're not always going to act in the ways that you want to act in. Like I blow up at people sometimes because the tension in my body and the, you know, whatever the reason it's like, yeah, I think I, you ever get, like, whenever I've heard you talk in an assertive, you know, oh, there's a line you've just kind of edged into it. Uh-huh. I'm just going to tell you right now where, where you're at. Yeah. <laughs> I well, know you've always kind of hit the nail on the head. You've always, uh, yeah. I've, I think that's a good quality about you, actually. Okay. You're super in touch with this inner work, these, this, these emotions, uh, yeah. awareness. And you have a good relationship with, with almost like, yeah, standing your ground where it needs to be stood, you yeah. know? I think, by the way, I think that's because we've built a good trust between us. You know, we, I trust you and you're a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. um we talk deeply and intimately about things um yeah definitely don't manage that with with all people but i really i really appreciate you saying that that's a really good thing to hear and i do i agree it's like i am firm but fair sometimes nice i think my one of my friends that i used to know um a few years ago would say you're an you're an occasionally blunt blunt dude <laughs> it was his way of saying <laughs> yeah, I recognize that in you. Um, yeah. Right. Before we wrap this up, I just want to ask you, what's your, do you have a practice? What's your, I'm going to start asking people what their, what's their yeah. daily practice or weekly? What would you think? Yeah. Thanks. That's, I love that word. Um, just because you said that it exists in noun and verb form as well, mm, um, which is amazing. <laughs> um, so for me, I meditate regularly. Um, I'll spend at least 15 minutes a day doing that. Um, I do breath work, um, Wim Hof style. And that's part of the men's group that I'm um, part of, which is Man Talks Alliance. And it's online. Um, so nutrition is a really, really important part of my life. Um, and I try to be intuitive about that too if my body's like telling me to eat something i try to eat eat it um exercise is really important to me um so i try and exercise once a day um but then apart from that just be creative i'm a creative person um i try and be creative once a day so if it's like i'm writing i've got writing projects going on and i i play the saxophone so i try and do that once a day as well Obviously, it's a bit weird now during lockdown, like uh, or shelter in place is a little, little bit nicer way to put it. But um, it's a bit strange now, isn't it? Because we've all sort of, you know, cha- our lives sort of changed in that sense. But it's been, I think, a morning routine is really important to me. So getting a morning routine together and getting kind of habit habit forming routine together, mm-hmm. and and then just all of the things that we've been talking about, I like my habit is to sort of bring meditation into my life and to understand what my responses are um, and sort of be conscious and aware. So I'd say that. Nice. I can't, I can't think of much else. 
mean, I love nature, love nature. I'm very blessed to live in a very forested area, actually, which I hadn't realized. And then we have the ocean, which is like a couple of miles down the road. Sure, mate, I love that. And I love that you said nutrition, because I think that's a fact it is. It's a a pillar, isn't it? It's a principle. Yeah. Well, it's like gut, gut, and heart, a... gut, heart, and head. You know, it's those. Yeah, those are the three centers of neural network, and yeah, it's really important to to listen, to develop a uh, respect for your body, for your gut, mm-hmm. like how it's functioning. Um, I think really that was a big change for me. A big a big change in my life came when I was like, okay, I have to take this seriously in a way. Like I, I try and be like humorous and enjoy everything that I do, but, but actually I want to be intentional about what I put in my body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a difference between intentionless and intentionless at uh, serious and intentional. Yeah. We always used to joke because um, like I mentioned, I'm a sound engineer and we used to tour a lot. And, and after the shows um, when we were younger, like mid twenties, we used to go out and get fast food after every gig, you know, we, and we used to, you yeah, know, man. and and that's a, you know, that even that is a, is a serious burden on your body actually to put that yeah. food in your body late at night when you can't digest it properly. And, and it gives you the wrong energy. It's, um, but we used to joke, we're like one for the body temple and then we all used to laugh, but it's, Ah, uh, it's yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Well, I'm a DJ, so it's like sometimes uh, I'll yeah. play till midnight and then I'll have food after. Right. And then it just throws you out. It's, yeah. it's and that's not even including alcohol yeah. that I used to consume a lot. It's, it's, yeah. I've stopped drinking for the time being. Yeah. 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 Same, Same I, I have. To... And it's it that's again, that's another it's another yeah. conversation because yeah. I'd love to unwrap that more. Well, let's do it. Let's do it in the future. Yeah, we will. Let's do it. Yeah. So where can be? Yeah. So you post on Instagram more than anyone I know, uh-huh. and that is just. And don't take that the wrong way. Like, it's not states. like an unconscious <laughs> thirsty for the likes. It's literally posts anything of beauty, and it can be the most simplest yeah. thing: a flower. Um, like. <laughs> it's mainly outdoors isn't it or it's yeah. a book review you 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 read a lot i read a lot um, it's true yeah that's another of your practices for sure yeah it is you're right you're um right. but that, again education and, and it, it's all encompassing and yeah. it's interesting when you it's because mm. some people don't break it down as oh this is my practice this is my practice but i suppose that anything you do within with intentions a practice right um yeah. and you come back to continuously yeah but it's it's interesting anyway let's wrap yeah. it up yeah Thank you so much. Yeah, you can find me on Instagram or, or Medium, actually. I post arc- articles on Medium. Medium? I don't yeah. know that. Medium. Medium, medium.com. It's a place for, um, it's like a social media for um, articles and journalism. It's decentralized journalism, basically. Nice. Yeah. Good little throw in there. Yeah. Nice. All right, Pete. Love you, nice. mate. Yeah, love you too. Thanks so much. Thank you.